The World Eaters, the once loyal legion of crazed berserkers led by Angron, the Red Angel. We've gone into extensive detail about the mighty Angron and his wacky exploits as he tracks down criminals with his dot. Uh, wrong lore. Um, from stopping a titan from falling on him and getting into physical confrontations with many of his brothers, Angron is an insane primarch at the head of an insane legion. One individual stands out amongst the world eaters though. An individual that doesn't spend hours shouting for blood and slamming his head into the wall for corn. Well, not all the time. Karn, the captain of the 8th Assault Company, the equerry to the Primarch, or as he is more recently known as, Karn the Betrayer. Karn's lore spans back to some of the earliest editions of Warhammer 40,000, getting his big start in the 2nd edition back in 1996. He's had the same model since the most recent revamp in the last handful of years. I mean, he did, get, he did move from a pewter model to a resin model, but for the most part it's been the same sculpt. For a champion of Korn, his story always has been one of bloodshed and mayhem, which is to be expected, but with the Horus Heresy, we get a much different character. Arguably my favorite character arc from the series, in the books Butcher's Nails and Betrayer by Aaron Dembski Bowden, we finally get a glimpse of the man Karn was before he became the Betrayer. Today we'll be exploring the rich lore of the Equerry of Angron, spanning Karn's first days in the Warhounds all the way to his current shenanigans in the Dark Imperium. Before we get started, I want to give a quick shout out to My Name is Biff. He did some voice acting in this video that I can't wait for you guys to get into, but he really helped bring to life the character of Karn. And if you haven't, he is the Destiny lore channel on YouTube, so please, please go and check him out. He's a great guy and an overall delight to work with. Nothing but good things to say about him. But now, it is time to talk about Karn. Unlike most of our grand tales of Warhammer 40,000, we will not begin on some far-flung planet, but rather in the cradle of humanity itself, Terra, in the Earl region. After the Unification War and before the launch of the Great Crusade, each legion's forces had to be mustered and built out. Karn was amongst the first neophytes of the 12th Legionis Astartes, the Warhounds. Transferred to the planet of Bot, Karn began his training amongst his brothers under the centurion Gruner. We might have touched on this in other videos, but every legion typically has their own name for either companies or captains, sometimes both. In this case, the captains of the Warhounds are Centurions, who in turn lead assault companies, other than just normal companies. Even before the coming of Angron, the Warhounds were known for their savage and brutal approach to warfare, preferring hand-to-hand -hand combat over firing lines or practiced elaborate strike plans. Trained in a gauntlet of hellish trials, Karn eked out a strong sense of martial prowess amongst the other recruits. Gruner, the master of neophytes, introduced the trainees to a tradition known as the Contest, which was a race to get 1,000 skulls. So even before the influence of Korn, we already have a legion that is hellbent on taking skulls in the name of the Emperor, which is interesting to say the least. It's worth noting that most legions, prior to reuniting with their respective Primarch, share the traits that their Primarch embodies. This is due to the gene seed implanted in each one, already sort of having that genetic makeup built into them. Angron might have been a far nobler individual had he not been lost to the butchered nails and gladiatorial pits of Nuceria. And we truly do get a mirror of what a possible loyalist Angron would look like in Karn. A man of noble stature with bronzed skin and tempered fury, wild in combat but focused and deliberate. By the time Angron was discovered on New Syria, Karn had risen to the rank of Centurion of the 8th Assault Company. With an interesting bit of foreshadowing, 8 is the fabled number of Korn. Even before reuniting with Angron, the Legion is seemingly placed on the path straight to the Lord of Skulls. There's even rumors of the Warhounds using blood to put gang signs on stalls throughout the malls of the Imperium. W well, not really, but, but the writing is definitely on the wall. No, no pun intended there. As many Primarchs were discovered and reunited with their respective legions, the Warhounds continued their service to the Emperor in the earliest years of the Great Crusade. The reunification of Primarch and Legion would be a vastly different experience for the 12th, though. 
Upon Nuceria, Angren was discovered in the aforementioned gladiatorial pits. In a grand as Spartacus-esque revolt, Angren fought against the armies and powers of the planet at the head of an army of slaves and former pit fighters. The Emperor came to Angren on the eve of the final battle of the revolt. Angren's father informed him that they were surrounded and would die to a man in the coming conflict. Angren, not one to walk away from the brotherhood born of war, denied the Emperor's invitation into the Imperium. The next morning, as the armies clashed, the Emperor teleported Angren away from his army and into the Adamant Resolve, a flagship of the 12th Legion. This uh, got things started on the wrong foot, which is a tragic understatement. As the captains of the Warhounds tried to bring their enraged father to reason, explaining the grand purpose of the Grand Crusade, each one was slaughtered in the cell that the Primarch was sequestered in. Only one man was able to sway the Red Angel. Karn entered the cell, stoic, composed, ready. The walls covered in the blood of the former captains hoping to entreat with Angren. Karn numbered amongst the last few captains left in the Legion, and that hadn't been brutally murdered by their father. Angren was upon Karn in a flash, beating and attacking the centurion. Karn did not flinch or move. Instead, he took each blow from his father, gritting his teeth and continuing on in his conviction of explaining the many deeds of himself and the warhounds that they had already accomplished. Supplicating to his father, but not fleeing in the face of his wrath, Karn did what his brothers could not. He showed him the great strength of the Legion, shattered and beaten. Karn was able to sway their father into leading the Legion, showing the Primarch the responsibilities of his station. There was still one thing separating father and son, though. The Butcher's Nails. The Butcher's Nails are a uh, cerebral implant created on New Syria from the Dark Age of Technology. Implanted directly into the user's brain, they enhance the ferocity of the fighter by dulling all other emotions, minus the regulation of adrenaline. As the nails had activated, it had bite into the user's skull. Only the fury of combat would ease the pain as the fighter became more and more dependent on the emotion-deadening nails. Over time, the butcher's nails would degrade the user's brain, creating a uh, blood-drunk berserker lost in a haze between conflicts. These effects would take many years to manifest and were evident in even Angren's own original nails. On the planet of Gehenna, the World Eaters were tested against a society which had held on to the technological wonders of the Dark Age. And this was a very tense time in the Legion. Sentiments are split, right? You have elements that are entirely dedicated to their oath to the Primarch and the Emperor. On the other hand, there is a rising sect of dissidents that find the brutality brought on by Angren diminishes the original, or I guess regal, name of the Warhounds. Angren had instilled a policy in the Warhounds, that if a planet did not fall within 31 hours, 31 hours being the standard day length on Nuceria, there would be what was called a decimation, where world eaters were killed as punishment. Gehenna failed to fall within the allotted time, and Mago, a Terran-born ex-Warhound centurion, refused to enact the decimation that Angren demanded. The result was a small revolt against the regime with Mago looking to destroy the research being done to the Butcher's Nails and reclaim the name of the Legion. Mago feared that the Legion was going down a path of damnation. The attempt to destroy the Nails failed, and Karn was the first to volunteer for the implantation of the Butcher's Nails, something that had a 100% fatality rate. Well, I suppose Karn is so badass that he makes his own 0.01% chance. Uh, reverse engineering Gehenna technology, the Butcher's Nails were implanted in more and more world eaters. In what would become known as the Gehenna Massacre, the Legion quelled the, the mini-coup, uh, with Angren killing Mago in a duel, and absolutely annihilated any and all Gehennans that the world eaters came across. The Butcher's Nails and the future legacy of the Legion was born in a shower of bloodshed and carnage. Karn's willingness to take the Nails further endeared him to the Primarch, and was seen as the first of the Legion worthy of their father. He was then promoted to Equerry to the Primarch, a hotly contested appointment, as while Karn was noble in manner or at least intention, he was still particularly wild. Quick to anger and known to fly into berserk fits in combat, Karn was not the direct foil to the Primarch that the Equerry title was intended for. 
Instead, Karn would rarely rebuke his father, and more often than not was the one following him deeper and deeper into conflict, edged on by the nails. Regardless, no one was crazy enough to challenge the equerry for the position. As unhinged as Karn seemed, he had a true passion for killing. You know, like a chef, only entirely homicidal. Horus had a death counter even installed in Karn's visor as a gift, a testament to his love for the fine art of murder. As the Great Crusade raged on, the World Eaters fought in a number of engagements with other legions, namely the Blood Angels, Imperial Fists, and Luna Wolves. As is customary for these campaigns, the upper echelon command structure typically becoming quite close. The same was true for Angren and the captains of the aforementioned legions. Forming a close bond with Sigismund, the first captain and Templar of the Imperial Fists, Angren passed on some of the World Eater's traditions to those he sparred with. Sigismund was known to use the tradition of binding his weapon to a chain wrapped around his wrist. Nasir Amit and Garviel Loken would also be influenced by the Equerry. Interestingly, Karn was not just some berserk killer. Uh, each captain remarked how composed and intelligent Karn appears when not in combat, or at least not overcome by the nails. While all of the other World Eaters suffer the ceaseless ticking of the nails in the mind, urging them to fly into brutal fits of rage, Karn held it together better than the rest. Although the trademark twitch that accompanied the ticking could be seen on Karn's face from time to time, he was otherwise a seemingly normal space marine. We get glimpses of this in The Flight of the Eisenstein, where Nathaniel Garo remarks that Karn's reputation for massacre, massacre to a degree that would repulse even the Death Guard, was betrayed by his composed and measured demeanor. Even Garviel Loken in the book Galaxy in Flames had established a good reputation with Karn, both being known for their impeccable dueling skills. This unfortunately did not match the Primarch, who had no desire for brotherhood amongst the other Primarchs. This is reinforced in such famous battles as the Night of the Wolf, where the World Eaters and Space Wolves clash on the planet of Malkoya. Each step further down the road to damnation, Karn openly tread claiming more and more victims while the letters high score flashed on his visor after every engagement. No conflict would compare to the one ahead and nothing would test the captain's ability to reap skulls like the fratricide that is the Horus heresy. Now, we haven't really drilled down on this conflict, but for most of the loyalist legions, the heresy began on Istvan V. But for the traitor legions looking to purge their loyalist elements, the fight started on Istvan III with the Istvan III atrocity. I've yet to do the full-fledged video on this, but let me give you a quick rundown of Istvan III. The main goal was for Horus to purge all the loyalist elements of the traitor legion. Death Guard, Emp Emperor's Children, World Eaters, and the newly named Sons of Horus, the previously named Luna Wolves. The battle was a massive pitched fight, with virus bombs detonating around the planet to try and completely purge the nearly one-third of each legion that was still loyal to the Emperor. During the conflict, we get a very interesting scenario. Garviel Loken of the Sons of Horus encountered a blood-mad Karn during the fray, and this is the first time we see Karn echoing the steps he is to take in the millennia to come. Loken tries to reason with Karn, but the World Eater flies at him in a berserk fury, shouting, I am the Eightfold Path. The duel was fierce, yet quick, Karn's wild swings paired by Loken's concentrated fighting style. Loken was able to kick Karn, impaling him on the dozer blades of a tank, leaving him for dead. Now, we don't quite know exactly what happened and how Karn lived through something as horrific as having a tank's dozer embedded in your chest. Uh, in fact, in the book Betrayer, Karn remembers near nothing of the Istvan III conflict, only glimpses and shadows of the memory that was. Nevertheless, the next time we see Karn, he's interrogating a Thousand Suns captain, Menes Kallistan. Kallistan is captured after the scouring of Prospero by a squad of world eaters on the planet. Now, there's an interesting moment between Kallistan and his goaler, who we find out through the short story Rebirth, uh, where Karn reveals that the world eaters are on the planet to retrieve a piece of the War Master's armor, the Moon Wolf. Kallistan uses his psychic powers to try and manipulate Karn, further divulging the reason of the World Eaters and why they're there. 
And this is where it gets spicy. Karn tells Kallistan that his true motive is finding some form of technology or arcane device that can rework or undo the effect of the Butcher's Nails. Kallistan admits that all such devices were destroyed in the conflict, but offers to heal Karn's mind. After a brief exchange back and forth, uh, tempers are raised and the conversation spirals into a brutal confrontation. Kallistan attempts to use his psychic powers to subdue Karn, but Karn's berserk mindset allows him to subvert any ability over his own mind, punching the Thousand Suns captain into a bloody pulp on the jail cell floor. Both of these instances, Istvan III and Prospero, uh, we get the beginning of the descent for Karn. He's starting to fall firmly into the lap of Korn. Even Kallistan remarks that this is evident behavior for a follower of the Blood God. At the same time, and it's something that we'll get into in our next section, we see that Karn is still very much present behind the berserk psychopath that overtakes him in combat. His motives are still relatively noble. I, I mean, as noble as they can be for a legion of crazed psychopaths that just want to play volleyball with people's skulls. But Karn desperately is trying to save Angren, and at the same time, his legion. He knows that the nails are their undoing, but let's explore the Shadow Crusade to really get into the depths of that. After many of the events of the Horus Heresy, we have the prolonged war between the Ultramarines and a combined force of word bearers and world eaters. This is the main stage for the book Betrayer. The Shadow Crusade is the Traitor Legion's war of attrition against the realm of Ultramar. Aimed at both stalling and destroying Raboot Gilliman's pride and joy, the world eaters and word bearers fought back to back, 80s style, throughout the conflict. This was essentially a big grudge match for Lorgar, Primarch of the Word Bearers, against Gilliman for destroying Monarchia. And there's a lot of big brother doesn't love me sentiment that has colored a lot of Lorgar's actions and motives, but that is reserved for his respective video. The World Eaters, on the other hand, just wanted another playground to murder their way through, and this was no different. This is where the grand bromance of Argol Tal, Galvor Bach of the Word Bearers, and Karn begins. The two would, you know, romp throughout the world of Armatura, wearing boat shoes and throwing finger guns at any of the female remembrancers while slamming White Claws. <laughs> In all seriousness, this is a, a very poignant relationship throughout the book Betrayer, and as I said earlier, really colors the perception we have of Karn as not simply someone who was great at killing people with chain weaponry. Throughout the Shadow Crusade and the conflict of the aforementioned Armatura, we see a close kinship grow between these two cousins from different legions. They both abhor the depths to which their legions have fallen, but both are entirely faithful to their Primarch. There's a lot of the duality in both characters that comes to light throughout the publication. So much so that Argol Tal is able to, uh, I guess snap is a good word for it, snap Karn out of his berserk and blood-mad tendencies. This, of course, rustles the jimmies of Erebus, first chaplain of the word bearers and ever asshole of chaos. But we'll get back to that. Tal and Karn have a number of discourses over the state of their legions, uh, their Primarch's motivations, as well as the nature of their existence through duels, tense moments in between battle plan meetings, so on and so forth. And I'd like to share an exchange directly from the Betrayer between the two. The backdrop for this conversation is during the mustering prior to an attack on a planet. Uggles Hall is speaking directly into Karn's mind as they both mount their warriors in drop pods and thunderhawks. He is no Primarch. He is my Primarch. A Primarch should be inspiring. Our genetics should react at the mere sight of them. Think of the moments you laid eyes on Horus, Dorn, or even Magnus. I have seen Sanguinius and Russ with my own eyes as well. Close enough to touch their armor. Think of when you stand before Lorgar, the awe and reverence that beats through your blood. The feeling of our genetic coding reacting to the pinnacle of the human process. I have never felt that instinctive respect for anger and Karn, not once. He is a broken thing. Devastating, unrivaled in war, but broken. 
You feel it. I know you feel it too. Yes, we feel the same. The World Eaters, each and every one of us knows what you know. Then why do you tolerate it? What can we do? Murder our own father? Did you destroy Lorgar when he led you into worshipping the Emperor? Or did you tolerate him in patience, hoping that eventually he'd find his way to equaling his brothers? It's our shame to bear before the other legions, brother. Angren was broken long before he ever reached us. Why do you think we let him beat the nails into our heads? We hoped that by breaking ourselves on the same anvil, we'd finally feel unity with our father. It didn't work? No. It didn't. Karn was just voiced there by the uh, prestigious My Name is Biff, so if you haven't already, please go and check out his channel. He's a great guy. Amazing grasp on the lore of destiny. But this exchange shows us that the very strong relationship between these two characters, uh, two characters that I would argue truly act as the personification of their legion, while also the tragedy of how noble men can follow tyrants. Well, I mean, as noble as someone, again, with a demon locked in within his chest can be, like Argol Tall is. The conversation is spoken with a, a level of candidness that is reserved for brothers and close friends. And these two are speaking their mind with, with utter sincerity. Especially towards the end of the conversation, you can hear the finality in the uh, sentiment of Karn, wanting Angren to be better and wanting his legion to be able to connect with him on a common ground. A common ground that has always existed for Argol Tal and the Word Bearers. As the conflict on Armatura came to its height, the Word Bearers were baited into an elaborate trap by the Ultramarines, resulting in a collapse of many tons of building onto their Primarch. In a pretty epic moment that we cover in the Angren video, the Red Angel stops the Titan's foot in mid-descent and then crawls out of the wreckage of half of a city. And this is relevant to Karn because as the World Eaters witness this, Angren throws down one of his fabled weapons, Gore Child, which was smashed to pieces. Karn then picks up the discarded weapon, far from the sight of his brothers, and orders the Dark Mechanicus to search the ruins for the missing teeth of the axe. The lore of this weapon spans far back into the earliest editions of Karn's lore, a grand chain axe with teeth of a mica dragon from the planet Luther McIntyre. It's the renowned weapon of Karn that has been his keepsake across the many years of Warhammer 40,000 lore. In the Horus Heresy, we finally get to hear the genesis of this weapon. On the Primarch's planet of Nuceria, there was a gladiatorial superstition that using a discarded weapon was considered bad luck, hence the need to hide it from Angren's eyes. Speaking of New Syria, our tale comes full circle and back to the planet that Angren once called home. A full-scale slaughter of all the inhabitants of the planet by both the World Eaters and the Word Bearers went underway, destroying the planet's inhabitants before being caught in a surprise attack by Gilliman and the Ultramarines. That's more the focus of Angren and his ascension to Demon Primarch, but it's worth noting as this is where Argol Tal, quote unquote, dies in the shadow of great wings. By the end of the Betrayer, Erebus shows his ugly face once more and arranges a situation in which Argol Tal is killed by his own hand. Plunging the Athame dagger into his back, Argol Tal is killed on top of the Imperator class titan, Corinthian, beneath a giant Imperial Aquila the great ring wings from his prophesied doom. Karn is obviously outraged by the murder of his beloved friend, but plays it close to the chest. Erebus was afraid that Argol Tal's interference with Karn's murderous rampages would ultimately stymie him from becoming the famed Karn the Betrayer, and thus losing the war for the traitors. Argol Tal was also attempting to soothe and kind of diverge Karn from his faith, fate as the champion of Korn. As a quick aside here, there are so many of these moments throughout the Horus Heresy, where Erebus convinces the powers that be that one character needs to die or be corrupted in order for their victory to be complete. They, they do it with Sanguinius and a number of other characters. It just lends to the credence that the ruinous powers are fickle, and similar to the Oracle of Delphi of Greek antiqu antiquity, they speak in riddles, purposely misleading or misguiding their own for their own pleasure. But be that as it may, in the closing portions of the book, in the epilogue, 
Erebus is fighting in the gladiatorial pits of the world leaders, defeating Sergeant Skane in a bout of first blood duel. There, Karn challenges him to a duel. Stripped from waist up and holding Gore Child bound to his wrist with a mighty chain imitating the fighting traditions of Nuceria. Sanguis extremis, the duel was to the death. Erebus approached it with a certain bravado for a man that had seen 10,000 futures. That was beaten out of him in the first three blows from Karn, rending a wound down his chest. In between each round of hits, Karn only says two words. Get up. Erebus' return swings were dodged before three more strikes from Karn brought the chaplain low, a look of bored indulgence, as the book puts it, painted on his face. A final three ring out from Karn as Erebus's hand is severed and he loses his Crozius. Corzius. Get up, is all that is spoken from Karn once more. But the chaplain is frozen in place by the presence of the Gore Child's teeth along his spine. Fear and doubt cloud his mind as none of this was skained to him in any of the many futures he saw. In the final split second before Karn activated the Gore Child's teeth, Erebus was able to teleport himself to safety escaping his fate. Now, a pretty important subtext of this confrontation is that this is of course on the heels of Erebus slaying Argyll Tall, but it also falls in line with the moment where Lorgar tricks Angren into his ascension as a full demon primarch, Karn again being the first person to communicate with his newly ascended father. So you can imagine that Karn is none too happy with the word bearers at this point. And Angren goes on to lead the world eaters to a murder party throughout the cosmos you know, denying Horus' summons to Ulinor before the grand push to Terra. Perturabo and the Iron Warriors are sent to rein in the raging beasts of Korn. After the interaction devolves into a conflict, the world leaders are eventually quote-unquote convinced, if you want to use that word, uh, it kind of feels weird, uh, to join up at Ulinor and head for Terra. We don't see Karn again until the Siege of Terra, and even then, what we know from the conflict is not the fully fleshed out one that we will hopefully have by the end of the set of books chronicling the Siege of Terra. For the oldest portion of the lore, this is where the story of Karn the Betrayer begins. A champion of the World Eaters and Korn rampaging through thousands of loyal Astartes, killing, maiming, burning, leading every assault and breaching the Lion Gate. Karn fought with reckless abandon, his kill counter blinking a new kill with each swing of Gorchild. When last seen, he was dead atop a mound of corpses. We do get a bit of a reveal on how he is resurrected though. A group of world eaters brings his corpse back to the ships leaving the planet at the end of the siege. Lost, broken, and fragmented, the world eaters fled the planet. Angren, having abandoned his legion in his own enraged pursuits, left his sons to fight amongst themselves. With Karn dead, the assembled world eaters fought over his corpse, deciding who should lead the legion. The blood spilled from the conflict, splattering the lifeless blob body of Karn, but as it seeped into his wounds, it revived the downed centurion, who returned the lead once more. Shortly after the Siege of Terra, Karn led the remnants of the 12th legion to the planet of Scalathrax, deep within the Eye of Terror. The Emperor's children had already established a foothold on the former Eldar planet, using the lost soul stones as uh, offerings to their patron god Slanesh, who like loves Eldar souls more than anything. A massive planet-wide battle broke out between the two opposing forces, the Emperor's children seeking to secure more offerings for their god, while the world leaders demanded skulls for theirs. In probably the most iconic conflict of Karn's history, a warp-born frost began to cover the planet the conflict having driven it out from the planet itself. This forced both of the forces into a temporary ceasefire as they found shelter from the cold. So potent was this storm, if you want to call it that, that it could even kill the advanced physiognomy of a space marine in a matter of seconds. This enraged Karn, as the Emperor's children were fighting on their back foot already as it was. Karn took up a flamer and gore child, going from shelter to shelter killing every marine he came across, Emperor's children and world leader alike, disgusted by the cowardice of his own legion. During this rampage, he was attacked by three legionnaires from the mist. As Karn repelled the attackers, the last one revealed himself to be Centurion Gruner, the master of neophytes which had trained him a lifetime ago. 
laughing in the face of Gruner's claims that Karn had committed a grand sin by killing his own brothers, he slaughtered his former master. This earned him the title of the Betrayer and the moniker he would be known throughout the millennia. This single act fractured the World Eaters, who broke off into multiple warbands, carving out their own corners of the Eye of Terror or lending their berserk fury to another warlord. Karn's own personal band of berserkers was known as the Butcher Horde and followed him through many conflicts to come, namely the Wars of Armageddon. Karn would weave in and out of the stories of the next 10 millennia, popping up during the Seventh Black Crusade to aid Abaddon and his machinations. Karn's own ship rammed the Blood Angel's Sanguine Terror, where the Champion of Korn fought a dozen Terminators entirely on his own before his warband showed up to swarm the ship. First into the fight and last out, a strategy that he had replicated time and time again since the Siege of Terra. And this is not from some battle-born nobility to lead his men, but rather the increased opportunity for bloodletting and skull gathering in the name of Korn. Karn the Betrayer most recently showed up during the 13th Black Crusade, where he led his butcher horde against the forces of, K of Cadia, helping to smash the defenses wherever he was deployed, but most notably would be his interaction with the Saint Celestine. After the Battle of Cadia and the Celestine Crusade to Terra, Karn met with the Saint on the planet of Sardreka, where she was aiding Imperial Fists and Imperial Guardsmen against a Chaos Invasion. The two fought in a brutal duel, which ultimately ended in the Saint being killed by Karn, who took her head to be added atop the mighty throne of skulls for Korn, further cementing the blood-soaked legacy of Karn. Karn the Betrayer has been one of the most iconic figureheads of the world leaders and the worshippers of Korn. For thousands of years, he has terrorized the Imperium and Grander Cosmos, killing everything that the galaxy can throw at him. Other greater demons, hive tyrants, necron overlords, war bosses, everything falls before Karn. He has been seen dead on multiple planets, but always comes back to reap the living and take the souls of men. Behind the Mask of the Berserker is still a calculated individual that does have some of his former nobility baked into the blood-crazed mind of his. Even Abaddon knows not to underestimate the cleverness of Karn the Betrayer. But as long as there are skulls to take, Karn will continue to fight for Korn, shouting out, Kill. Maim. Burn. I want to thank you guys so much for joining me on the tale of Karn the Betrayer here. Uh, he's a very special character for me, and one of my favorites from my earliest days in the hobby. He's always been this titanic fighter, being argued to be the single best duelist in the game alongside Gazkol way, way back in the Armageddon supplement days. With a nice updated model and some new rules, Karn still has some tricks up his sleeve. Before I close this video out, I want to give one final shout out to My Name is Biff for his amazing voice acting for this video. I cannot thank him enough, and I strongly urge you to check out his channel, find out more about the deep lore of Destiny. Uh, but if you guys want me to do more of these uh, kind of side characters, I guess you could say, to the Horus Heresy narrative, but I think still incredibly important, right? Like when you take a look at Sigismund, uh, he plays a very important role because he kind of creates the character of the Legion of the Imperial Fists without it really influencing um, Rogaldorn itself. And it's the same thing here with Karn. Karn, you can get a lot of really strong emotional responses from the world leaders as a whole without it actually being Angram and thus cheating Angram's character. So I really enjoy these characters, especially Garviel Loken, right? Who has gone on to do a lot of crazy things since his first iteration in the first three books. Ooh, spoiler, sorry. Um, but these, these side characters, I think, are what make the Horus Heresy such a strong series because we get to see, sure, we get to see how the descent of some of our famous, our favorite Primarchs is gone, but these captains have given us the character of a Legion that was so loyal up to a certain point and then made a hard plummet into corruption, into heresy. So it's, it's always really fun to explore these characters with you guys, and I hope you enjoy uh, diving into some of them with me. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a good one and take care.